camp out for, for the most part in, in the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to take a look at Acts 4 towards the end and the beginning of Acts 5. Um, we want to look at what is possible in our church when we are reverent of God and what that looks like. So the possibilities that the church can do when we are reverent of God. We also want to take some time and look at the consequences of showing contempt to God, to the Holy Spirit, um, and just having a lack of reverence to them. Uh, so it's a little bit of both. Um, but before we begin, I think it's important we, we understand what the word reverence means and what it is. Um, reverence is, is a deep, deep respect to someone or something. Um, most of you guys have reverence towards your parents because they raised you and you loved them. And you know there's certain lines and boundaries you should not cross. Um, to your wives, to your spouses, to your best friends, um, there are certain things we wouldn't do to them because we love and respect them for, for who they are. Um, so we want to look at what reverence is when it comes to God. Um, reverence, guys, it, it, it's who we are. It's what we do. It's a lifestyle. It's not an event. It's not something that we get to pick and choose at, at our convenience. Uh, it's who we are, not what we do. Uh, so, so with that said, why don't we go to God in prayer first, and then we can open up uh, our Bibles. Uh, like I said, we'll be in, in, in Acts, so we'll, we'll turn to Acts 4 first, but let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father, thank you so much uh, for this morning, for the new faces that we get to see here uh, in the building, for the people at home who have taken their time uh, to set aside some time to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity, God, that you've given us to, to open your word and come to you in prayer uh, for the opportunity to be called your sons and daughters. I pray, Lord, that, that you're, uh, you're with us this morning, uh, that we let scripture speak on your behalf, uh, and that we leave this building uh, that much closer to you. We love you. We pray in your son's name. Amen. So why don't we turn to Acts 4? Uh, we're going to look at the, the last half of, or the last piece of Acts 4. And afterwards, we'll look at Acts 5. Um, so Acts 4, uh, verse 32. That's what we'll start. Acts 4, verse 32. All the believers were united in heart and in mind. And they felt what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one of the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means sons of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know what the book of Acts is about, the book of Acts is about the establishing of the first century church. Um, so we're, we're going to look at the beginning and what the church looked like. And man, what an incredible glimpse we get to see at what the first century church looked like. Um, and I say it's a glimpse because it really is just a glimpse. We get five verses on what the church looked like. We get from verse 32 to 37. Uh, prior to that, um, you have Peter and John and some of the other apostles uh, writing about their experiences sharing in the faith. Uh, but this is a, a very small glimpse of what the church looks like uh, as it first is established. Um, we read the victories. There is no need. People are united. They are one in mind. Um, they, they rejoice um, and they speak powerfully in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and God has blessed the church. Um, it's a glimpse, guys. I, I'm a history teacher, uh, so uh, I actually I teach a lot about um, the, the first century church a lot because it's part of our curriculum. Um, at the time, um, the book of Acts, when the book of Acts was written, 
uh, there was an emperor. His name was Nero. Um, and at the time in the Roman Empire, emperors would just come and go. Every 10, 15 years, you have a new emperor. Every 10, 15 years, they would either die, get killed, resign, something of the sort. Uh, so every 10 or 15, there, there was just a lot of instability uh, in, in the Roman Empire. And that wasn't good for, for our, our, our fellow brothers and sisters at the time. Um, Christianity was illegal for about 300 years. And in those 300 years, um, they, they faced a lot of hardships, a lot of troubles, uh, a lot of persecution. Um, they were subject to arrest. Uh, they were being crucified for, for what they believed. For what they believed. Um, and I know there's children here, so, so I'll keep it PG, but sometimes their bodies were used as candles uh, in substitution for daylight at night. And yet, all God wants us to read are the victories of the church. God wants us to rejoice in their unity. Uh, God wants us to take light and encouragement in the things that they do. In a time of fear, doubt, and hardships, the church is a pillar of light. The church is a pillar of light. They don't back down. They don't cower. They don't turn to self-preservation. And this happened for 300 years. Christianity was illegal for 300 years in Rome. Um, for 300 years, these men and women, like verse um, 33 says, testified powerfully to the resurrection of Lord Jesus. What is my excuse? What is my excuse to not open my mouth? What is yours? What is your excuse for not wanting to discuss spiritual matters, for not wanting to talk about the resurrection with friends and family, with each other? What is your logic or reasoning for not speaking boldly of the resurrection? Uh, what is our excuse to not want to be here at the building? Those of you guys at home, what is your logic, your reasoning, your excuse to not have your cameras on? I don't know half of you guys deeply. Uh, it's just impossible to make friendships like that with 100 plus members. Um, but if, if I were Jesus, I'd guarantee that everybody at home would have their cameras on looking. Is there a lack, and not that I, I command y'all's respect, but is there a lack of respect between ourselves? Is there a lack of reverence for your brothers and your sisters in the building? And why? Why is that? Um, see, the first century church, from what I read, from the glimpse that we get, people loved and respected one another. Nothing they held was their own. They understood that everything belonged to God. Their, their families, their spouses, their, their lives, their possessions. They understood that everything they had was borrowed. There was a deep reverence for God. And it is for that reason that they were a light to the world. Um, when we have a reverence for God, man, the things that we can do as a church are incredible. It's incredible. We see growth in all areas like, like we see in Scripture. Um, spiritual growth in our walks with God, emotional growth within ourselves, um, physical growth in the building. Man, the book of Acts is full of, of documentation and writing where it the book, the church just grew and grew and grew because they understood the power of the resurrection and they had a reverence for the Lord. I think the question for us, church, is can the same be said for you and I first? Do you and I, do we have a reverence for the Lord? Again, it's not what we who, what we do, sorry, it's not what we do, it's not an event, it's not a pick and choose when you feel like being reverent to the Lord, it's a lifestyle, it's a walk. 
It's who you are. It's what defines you. As a church, are we reverent? If Jesus were to write something about the RGV church this morning, what would it be? Would it be this? That we are all united? That we are powerfully speaking about the resurrection? That we are meeting everybody, exceeding, not just meeting, but exceeding everybody's needs? I think we would check off some of those boxes. But I don't think it'd be a carbon copy of what we just read. Um, that as a church, that there is a lack of reverence. And why have we turned to self-preservation mode in this time of hardship? Have we said, no, God, I'm, I'm going to stop giving. I'm going to stop giving of my time and my money, and I'm going to focus on my four walls, on my family, and I'm going to take care of these people first. And your church and everything that goes along with your church, that comes second. Have we turned our faith from God and placed it on something else? I know at different times in my walk with God, I have. Um, I've, I've put my faith on, on myself, on my wife, um, on other people. Um, and all of those things just end up bad. It never turns out well. Have we lost reverence for the Lord? That's what we want to keep on coming back to. We're going to go ahead and read Acts 5. Um, and we're going to stay here a little longer. Uh, Acts 5, uh, we're going to start in verse 1. Acts 5 is an example uh, that God left in Scripture for you and I. It's an example of someone or somebody uh, who lacked a reverence for God and the Holy Spirit. In verse 1, it reads, But there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. At first glance, if we don't know who Ananias is, at first glance... He's just another member of the church like you and I. And he wants recognition. He saw what Barnabas did and the respect that earned him. And he wanted the same respect or the same praise. And at first glance, if we're outside the church, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Do you know the difference in yourself? When are you being real to yourself, to God, and when are you not? Very difficult to tell apart someone who is in reverence of God and someone who isn't. Uh, as we keep on reading, then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this price you and your husband received? Was this the price you and your husband received for this land? Yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter replied, how could the two of you even think about conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When a young man came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. I think, guys, at a superficial glance, we can read this story and think about money and greed. And it is, it's, it is about money and greed 
Um, but it's so much more to that. There's so much more to the story than just the love of money and, and greed, right? I think this story is, is so applicable to, to you and I, to us as a church. Uh, and for me, it's a wake-up call. Uh, it's a wake-up call to, to judge my actions, to judge my heart according to Scripture. And that's what we see in Scripture, right? You don't have to turn there, but in 1 Timothy 4.16, it says to, um, to, to judge your, your sorry, uh, I'm having a hard time flipping here. Uh, but it says um, in 1 Timothy 4, that way you guys can write it down, 4.16, uh, it reads, keep a close watch on how you live and on your own teaching. You guys can read the rest if you want, but that's what I want to highlight. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. And no one can do that. Your wife can't do that for you. Your children can't do that for you. Your friends can't do that for you. This is something personal between you and God. Um, this is a wake-up call to gauge my heart and my actions, to judge my life according to Scripture. Um, yes, it is about money and greed, but, but it's also about deceit. It's about lying. It's about contempt for the Holy Spirit. It's about wanting to be praised. It's about a husband who led his wife to destruction. Uh, it is a lack of reverence in every way towards God and the Holy Spirit. It is by far a lot more than just money and greed. In verse 3, Peter says, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. Everyone has heard the mustard seed parable, right? If you have as much faith as the mustard seed, Jesus can use that to, to do incredible things, uh, which is true and amen. But in the same way, um, in James 1, verse 15, um, as, as you guys turn there, in the same way, all Satan needs is a mustard seed worth of temptation. All Satan needs is a mustard seed worth of doubt. Uh, James 1, verse 15, again, you guys don't have to turn there, uh, but you guys can definitely write it in your notes. I'll go ahead and read it. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. I love those parallels that the Bible makes. The same way that Jesus can use your faith to do incredible things, Satan can use the same amount of doubt of temptation to do the worst of things. And it is so much easier, guys, to take out a seed than it is to uproot a plant. It is so much easier. We can lie to one another all we want. I can lie to Luke. I can lie to Omero and Joe. I can lie to these people all I, all, all I want. I can pretend to be the perfect disciple, but I can't lie to God. None of you guys can lie to God. And if you choose to lie to God, I, I'd be very, very concerned. Because look at what happens in Scripture when you choose to lie to God. God takes serious offense in our attempt to lie to him and to lie to the Spirit. He used Ananias and Sapphira as an example to the church then and to the church now. How are you lying to the Spirit this morning? How are you lying to the Spirit last week? How will you continue to lie to the Spirit after Sunday? When Thursday rolls around, when Friday night rolls around, as the weeks come, how will you show contempt to the Spirit? Remember, our walk with God, our reverence for God is a lifestyle. It's what we do, not who we are. How is your walk with God? You can't have reverence for God if you are not walking for him. And if you're going to sit there or think as you sit there that you don't have time for God, that you don't have time for eternity, then what do you want time for? If you don't have time for eternity, what do you want time for? Um... 
Safira, not knowing what had happened, uh, following her husband, follows up a couple of hours later, and is asked the same question. Is this what you received for the home? Now, she could have come clean, um, but instead she chose to lie. She chose to follow in her husband's footsteps. Um, and I, I can't talk about their walk with God. I, I, I don't know what was going on through their minds or, or their lives as this built up. Uh, but I do know that the spouse, the husband, led his wife to destruction. And men, you and I, not, not just the ones that are married, but the, the single brothers, the, the, the people, uh, the teenagers, those of you guys who are thinking about walking with God one day, us as men, we are charged with leading the church. Amen. That is our responsibility to lead the church. And as you guys go through different roles of your life, the church is something different. Right? But when I was in campus, the church was, was you guys. But my church were, were, were my, were my uh, college friends. It was my job to lead them to God as a man of God. It was my job to lead them. As I got married, it was my job to lead my wife to God. Now that I have a child, it is my job, my responsibility to lead that, God, to lead that child to God. How are we doing in leading our families? And not just our physical families, but, but our spiritual family. There is so much to take from this. Um, taking a look deep, asking yourself whether or not you have reverence for God, whether or not you're showing contempt to the Spirit, I can't answer that for you. It's something you need to evaluate your, yourself. But again, I'll say this. Make no mistake. If you are trying to lie to God today or tomorrow, God will judge you just as fiercely as he did Ananias and Sapphira. He may not strike you down. Um, I haven't heard about that in the, I don't know, the 26 years that I've been alive. I've never heard of God striking anyone down like that. Um, but he will. You will have to face him in, in, on judgment day, and he will strike you down just as fiercely. He will reject you just as hard as he rejected Ananias and Sapphira. Fortunately, you guys have today. You guys have tomorrow, maybe. I'm not sure. But you definitely have today. So what should your response be? What should our response as a church be? Well, if we read... Um, verse 10 and 11 it says instantly she fell to the floor and died when the young men came in and saw that she was dead they carried her out and buried her and her husband sorry they buried her beside her husband great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what happened our response your response this morning should be to be seized by fear. If you are lying, if you are considering lying to God or the Holy Spirit, your response, our, my response, should be to be seized by fear. And I think a lot of times we, we associate fear with, with a negative connotation, that, that, that fear is bad and fear is never good. Fear is, is somehow taken away from us, right? We, we, we shy away and we want to hide because we're, we're scared and we're frightful. So fear is less, but with God, fear is more. Amen. When we fear God, when you fear God, God will bless you. Amen. Right? We, we go back to Acts 4, uh, where, where we read, and you guys don't have to turn there, but it says God's great blessing was upon them all because they knew what it was to fear the Lord. And fear and reverence, guys, they, they go hand in hand. To fear the Lord is not to cower before him, but to fear the Lord is to understand who he is. Having fear for God is having a humble respect for God. Do you fear the Lord? Do you fear the Holy Spirit? 
because he is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. You and I, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Do we fear it? Sorry, not it, him. It is not an it, it is a person. Do we fear the Holy Spirit? In Proverbs 14, this might take a little while because I'm all Bible. In Proverbs 14, uh, verse 27. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Fear of the Lord is a life-giving fountain. Fear of the Lord is the life-giving fountain. You will not find life here on earth or in eternity without fearing God. And it's not just meant for you. It's a fountain. It overflows. It's meant for everybody. Who are you bringing to the fountain? Who are you bringing with you to the fountain? Who are you trying to explain the fear of God these days? Um, 27. It offers escape from the snares of death. Fear of the Lord is a life-giving fountain that offers escape from the snares of death. Again, I don't think God will strike you down. Uh, but when we fear God, we are given life. And we escape death. You, you escape dysfunction. Right? You guys have heard that dysfunction is a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Right? If you grew up in a bad household, if you grew up with a bad mother or father figure, if you grew up with challenging with a challenging background, dysfunction is a gift that keeps on giving. The likelihood is you are going to reciprocate that to your family one day. Yeah. If you grew up with one father or one mother, the likelihood of you getting a divorce is so much higher. Yeah. If you guys grew in debt and, and always chasing money but there was never enough, you will likely end up there as well. The solution to stopping dysfunction is fear in God is going to the fountain of life and escaping the snares of death. I want to leave you guys with a couple things this morning. Um, a couple things that, that we can learn from, from Ananias and Sapphira and, and, and even Barnabas. Um, one, like, like I said towards the beginning, it's very hard to judge someone outside of the, if, if we're coming, if we're looking from the outside. At first glance, Barnabas and Ananias had the same heart. Yeah, they wanted to sell so that they could give back. I don't know how you guys are doing. Whoever you get with might not even know how you guys are doing. We need to be vulnerable, not, not because we are being asked questions, not because we feel like we need to, but because we have a reverence for God. We need to be um, exposed to one another. Because when we don't talk to one another about what is happening in our lives, we are lying to the Spirit. When you guys aren't open, you are lying to the Spirit. When they ask you how you're doing and your answer is good and you are not doing fine, you are just as guilty as Ananias and Sapphira, I am just as guilty because I have done that so many times in my walk with God, for whatever reason. Uh, point two, we can't hide from God. We, just, we can't do it. There, there is no hiding from God. There are no hidden closets with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is with you. Fear is a part of worship. You cannot worship God without a healthy dose of fear. There is no way around it. Fear is a very important part of worship. Uh, and lastly, it might not seem like a big deal to us because it's a little white lie, but sin, no matter what it is, is offensive to the Lord. Sin, no matter what it is, is offensive to the Lord. Um, but the good news, again, is that fear is 
a life-giving fountain. If we go to God, if we fear Lord, sorry, if we fear the Lord, if we understand the power of the resurrection, we have life here on earth, and more importantly, we have life in eternity. Amen. So with that said, I am going to go ahead and pray for our communion. Uh, so if you guys would uh, please bow with me as we take some time um, and evaluate ourselves um, as we go before the Lord. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for your scripture and your word and how easy it is to read. Thank you for forgiving us the time to make time for eternity. Thank you for, for allowing us to fear you but not cower before you. That we have the confidence to, to stand with you because there is a reverence for you. Because we respect you, God. I pray, Lord, that, that as we take this this. Uh, this bread and, and this cup that we remember the resurrection that the first century church so boldly proclaimed. That we remember what Jesus went through and how his blood makes us as white as snow. I pray, God, uh, that, that each of us take time today, now or later, to really reflect on whether or not we have lost fear or reverence for you. God, and ultimately that we go to you because you are a fountain, that we remember you are a life-giving fountain, and that we bring other people to it. Uh, we love you so much. Thank you for, for your son who, who was willing to put in the hard work. Uh, for the people who have came before us and, and, and withstood the hardships that we don't have to. Uh, thank you for, for this time. We love you. We pray in your son's name. Amen.